this is absolutely fabulous. I, I am overwhelmed with the board, our board of the Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial has done tonight, and the people who prepared this. What an outstanding job. And it is my pleasure right now, we're going to get the program started, but uh, the preliminaries, if you will. So my role, my name is Al Muscovitz. You might have known me as Big Al on the Dick Purton Show. Any Dick Purton listeners? Where were you when the ratings came out? That's why I'm standing here alone tonight. But anyway, it's a real, real pleasure. And if I can have your attention, because we are so blessed to have this gentleman here to help us with this event. He has been unbelievably supportive. I can't say enough. It's a real pleasure to introduce our Master of Ceremonies for the Victory Gala. Guy Gordon is celebrating his second decade with Local 4 News and his 33rd year in Detroit television, which accounts for the gray hair. He's covered many of the biggest stories affecting Metro Detroit and its residents, including cross-country coverage of Pope John Paul II, Nelson Mandela, and the Chrysler GM bankruptcies. And the North American International Auto Show is still his favorite time of year. There is no automotive reporter in town quite like Guy Gordon. His biggest source of pride, undoubtedly, his three kids, his three children with his beautiful wife, Gail. And Guy demonstrates his commitment to the people who live and work in Metro Detroit. His annual charity golf outing, the Guy Gordon Classic for Kids, has raised, are you ready for this, more than $1.5 million for Oakland Family Services. Let's hear it. <laughs> Guy has, in Guy's generosity, he's decided to take the money from the kids and donate it back to the World War II Memorial. He doesn't know that, but we're going to talk at the bar in a few minutes about it. Anyway, we are happy that he is giving back yet again tonight as our Master of Ceremonies. The Victory Gala, I say gala, my kid said it's gala. I don't know which way you say it. Anyway, the committee would also like to thank Guy for all the media coverage he has provided leading up to tonight's special event. He fills in for Paul W., has had our board president on a couple times, Debbie Hollis, and then, uh, of course, he got us on Channel 4 on a couple occasions. We can't thank him enough. He is the son of a World War II veteran himself, so this means a lot to him. Ladies and gentlemen, and our distinguished veterans in attendance tonight, please, please give a great warm welcome to WDIV reporter and anchor, Mr. Guy Gordon. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Big Al. But most of all, thank you for coming and supporting our distinguished veterans, supporting the legacy, supporting our heritage. We may not be part of the greatest generation, though from the snow on my roof you might want to dispute that, uh, but we are their descendants, we are their heirs, and they're heirs to the legacy, and it's up to us to preserve it. So thank you for being here tonight. You've got a program book on your table, make sure you leap through it. Some really cool things and, and little historical touchstones on there. First of all, your ration card. You can cash that in at the Sunoco station. Never mind, it's a sick. <laughs> you also got your veteran's ID card. There's some great history in there. You can see what's planned for the Legacy Memorial. But perhaps the most important thing is all of us have a story. Every one of us have had someone in our family that served in World War II or served in the arsenal of democracy that made their mark during this incredibly important and critical time in our history. And if you want to preserve their story and their legacy, a brick paver is the way to do it. Now, if you've been down to Comerica Park, you've seen the brick pavers and all the families that have been longtime Tiger fans. It's a great touchstone for your family. So think about who you want to honor and then understand that tonight, and tonight only at the Victory Gala, a brick paper is 25% off. So if you love a good bargain, tonight's the night to take advantage of it. And uh, I'm going to be buying several for my Michigan uh, legacies, and I hope that you will too. And it would be a great way to say I love you to maybe uh, the surviving World War II veteran in your family or to someone that loved that person to say I care enough that I want to have their memory preserved at the Legacy Memorial. Now, all of us, as I said, have had our World War II memories. And the reason I'm here tonight is because of four people. My aunt, well, let me start with my uncle. My uncle lost a leg in the Battle of the Bulge. And he was a very important figure in my life. My Aunt Ginny happened to be the nurse in the hospital 
that tried to save his leg. They couldn't. He was a disabled vet for the rest of his life, but he found himself a bride in that hospital, even though she was a lieutenant and he was a private. <laughs> yeah, you understand. Yes, her commanding officer was like, this is not happening. Not on my floor. Well, it was a great romance that lasted nearly 60 years. We've lost them both, but they were both buried with honors at the uh, National Cemetery in St. Louis. On my father's side of the family, my uncle Hank lost his life 72 years ago next month on the way to the bulge in a section of France called Alsace. And my father at the time was fighting in the Pacific, on Guam. And he, uh, there was one particular day when his Browning automatic rifle, which they have on display over here, not his, but one like it, and, and thanks to the, the reenactor that showed that to me, because that's the first time I've ever held one of those weapons. His weapon jammed, and they were under intense fire from a Japanese machine gun nest. And they were getting slaughtered, and he had no weapon. So he did the one thing that he knew how to do well. He held the regimental record for throwing hand grenades. And he dumped a load of them, neutralized the machine gun nest, and was awarded the Silver Star. And he is still with us. He's in Grand Rapids, and at 91, he's still a Marine, still works for veterans' causes. Uh, but those are my four reasons for being here. A Silver Star, two Purple Hearts, and a heart of gold. And I will tell you that I will defend anybody's right in this country to protest any way they want to, and I will respect it. But that's why you'll never see me take a knee during the anthem. So we got some special guests here tonight. First of all, uh, a gentleman who has been very vocal in his support for the Legacy Memorial, uh, also a good friend. He's also my insurance agent. Please welcome Senator Marty Nolenberg. You see, I got that both in. I got the plug, I got the politics, I covered you on both fronts. Let's see if I get a God bless it discount. Of course, organizing an evening like this uh, takes a tremendous amount of time and dedication, and we've got so many people involved in this. You will see them in your program. If you see them, shake their hand and say thank you. Uh, we have the Victory Gala Committee, the board members of the Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial, please, youth committee members, and numerous volunteers involved. We could have had a separate program just to honor all of them. All of their names are in your program book. Please check it, shake their hand, give them a salute, give them a hug, but give them a huge round of applause right now. Now, you may have noticed that while we were all enjoying ourselves and hustling back and forth between the silent auction, there was a very impressive color guard going through their uh, official routine here on our podium. And they are uh, the Cass Tech High School Junior ROTC Color Guard. Where are they? Where'd they go? There they are back there. Please give them a round of applause. Excellent job. So please remain standing, if you will, as the Color Guard comes forward. Oh. Order, color. 
Brothers. Lafayette. Carry colors. Please give our thanks to the junior ROTC from Cass Tech. Go technicians! And please show your appreciation to this lovely lady. This is Lauren Sharp. Now, for those of you that are veterans, please, I know you've been standing for a while, but please continue standing, the rest of you, Please take your seats. Our World War II veterans, if you would remain standing, and our other veterans may take your seats. And we thank you for your service. Ladies and gentlemen, please salute the greatest generation. are the reason why we are determined to build this legacy memorial and we want it 
built while you can enjoy it and savor the honor which is yours. You may be seated. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And you're going to hear from one of our greatest generation in just a few moments, as well as a historian who has uh, put to paper their amazing story and Detroit's amazing story because we don't want to be lost in this is the fact that like no city, this city threw itself into the war effort as the arsenal of democracy and made the crushing of the Axis a reality. And on that note, I'd like to take a minute to read to you a very touching piece called The Fallen Soldier. As you enter the dining room this evening, you might have noticed a small table in the place of honor. It is set for one. We know that military life is filled with symbolism, and it's only fitting that as civilians we honor that. This table is our way of symbolizing that certain members of the profession of arms are missing from our midst. If you've ever been to see Les Mis, there's a song called Empty Chairs at Empty Tables. And we know that there are many of you who have lost people who are dear. Since they can't be with us this evening, we remember them because of their dedication and their commitment to this country. This is the fallen soldier. The table before you is set for one to symbolize the frailty of one soldier alone against their enemies. The tablecloth is white, symbolizing the purity of their intentions to respond to their country's call to arms. The single yellow rose, symbolizing remembrance, displayed in a vase, reminds us of the families and loved ones of our comrades in arms who keep their memories alive lest we forget. The red ribbon tied so prominently on the vase is a reminder of the blood shed to protect the liberty so loved by our country. A slice of lemon is on the bread plate to remind us of their bitter fate. There is salt upon the bread plate, symbolic of the family's tears. The glass is inverted because they cannot toast with us this night. The chair, as you see, the chair is empty. They are not here. Remember all of you who have served with them and called them comrades who depended upon their might and relied upon them to keep you safe. For surely they have not forsaken you. The fallen soldier. And now to learn more about this quest we, were, we are on, and it is a quest. It is a holy quest. It is my honor to introduce you to the President and Vice President of the World War II Legacy Memorial, Debbie Hollis and Russell Levine, for the presentation of tonight's Victory Awards. <laughs> Debbie and Russell, if you'll come forward. And, uh, and I'm afraid we don't have the awards here this evening. Yes, they are MIA. <laughs> they were so big, we couldn't get the high-low in to get them to you. <laughs> Debbie and Russell. Thank you, Guy. <clears throat> Hi, everybody, and thanks for coming tonight. We're going to get to the Victory Award in a minute or two, but I wanted to just take a minute or two to acknowledge why we're all here tonight. The World War II veterans that we're standing before the home front workers that stood with them during the war times that made sure that we saw victory during World War II. The Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial is meant to honor the men and women from Michigan who served on both the home front and the war front during the war. It's Michigan's story. It's how we became known as the arsenal of democracy. It's everything about our service, our sacrifice, our labor force, our industry, the commitment we made in our daily lives to the war effort, 
and the changes that it brought and how Michigan played a critical role in that victory. So we're here tonight to celebrate these veterans and those home front workers and to help see the memorial become a reality. We have a $3 million goal. We need your help to get there. We need you to fill out your pledge cards that are in your packets. We need you to bid on the live auction items. We need you to tell companies and philanthropists that this is a project that needs to be supported. These gentlemen that stood up earlier, they're in their 90s. They're not gonna be here a lot longer. And it would be tragic if they did not see this memorial built for them. We recognize that it's being built also for future generations so that they understand the story and so we can preserve their legacy. But we want these men and women to see it and we need your help. We're on a sunset clause and it's ending quickly. So thank you for coming tonight. We have a booth over here with a lot of information on the memorial. If you've not been there yet, after the speaker, please go over there, learn about the project, learn how you can help us. Now on to the Victory Awards. While we think that every single one of our World War II veterans are our absolute heroes, and we love each and every one of them, tonight we're recognizing two specific individuals. The one I'm going to introduce is Fireman First Class Art Fishman. His World War II service has taken him all over the world. If you want to follow it, you might want to pull out your phone and get your Google Maps app, because he's been everywhere. We like to call him our Energizer Bunny because even at 90, he has more energy than most of us put together. He's really awesome. He has gone from Pearl Harbor to Borneo to Guam to San Pedro Bay, the Philippines, Shanghai, Korea, and perhaps his most dangerous destination, New York City. Just to name a few of the stops he made during his military service. He was in both the Army and the Navy. But as tireless as his World War II journey was, I think his efforts to help us at the Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial have been equally tireless. Over the past few years, we've been able to bring him into our collective family. We love the enthusiasm he shows for our project. He's one of our best ambassadors. He is, he's got a heart as big as anything and anybody you know. He walks in parades with us. He does TV interviews, media interviews. He's been interviewed for marketing videos for us. He has spoken at our VJ Day events. He was instrumental in receiving an endorsement from the Jewish War Veterans, which included sponsorship money for the memorial itself and for tonight's Victory Gala. That's just the tip of the iceberg. If you ever want to pose for a photograph, Art is surely going to be there with his camera to take your picture. He's kind of our unofficial photographer for every event. He's helped organize volunteers on our behalf. He's enlisted fellow World War II veterans. Sometimes you might even see him driving up Woodward in a World War II Jeep that he's bringing to our events. And let me tell you, Art, with all due respect, if you see him driving, you might want to get out of the way. <laughs> Makes me a little nervous when I see him driving that Jeep. But anyways, one of my favorite stories, and this is brief, but it's worth telling. About a year ago, Art called Al Muscovitz and I and said, I have a great idea. I've put something together for you that I want you to use at your presentations. I think I can help you. I want to have breakfast with you. So we didn't know what he had put together, but we met for breakfast at Panera. Pulls out his laptop, and they were having some Wi-Fi issues that day, and he couldn't get online. And the waitress said, you know, you can go on through your phone. And me, not knowing how to do that, looked at Art and said, you know, Art, I wish I could help you. I don't know how to do that. And he said, don't worry about that. I know how to do it. So he connects Wi-Fi through his phone onto his computer, and he logs in, and he's showing us what he wants to show us. And then all of a sudden, he pulls out a PowerPoint. And he said, I've put together a PowerPoint of all sorts of photos from all of our events, and I think you can use it while you're presenting to people about the memorial. And I said, this is really great. So I started looking through the PowerPoint, and there were pictures from all of our events, page after page, slide after slide, and then all of a sudden there was a photograph of me in shorts and a t-shirt up north at the sand dunes. And I said, Art, where did you get this picture? And he said, oh, I stole that off your Facebook page. <laughs> and I said, well, what does that have to do with the memorial? 
And he said, well, truth be told, when I talk to people about the memorial, I like to tell them that you're my girlfriend. <laughs> and it was right then that I knew we had to give him an award one day. <laughs> so with that being said, I would like to introduce my very dear friend, Art Fishman. I'm, I'm being told I went out of order. We have a video that we're going to show before Art comes to the stage. I'm sorry. <laughs> He's 90 years old. He's helping the Boy Scout. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and he's helping the Boy Scout. <laughs> Debbie, I don't want to say in front of everybody here, but you know my feelings, buddy. Yeah. You too, sweetie. Russell, thank you. I just want to take this opportunity to give heartwell thanks to the World War II Legacy Committee for honoring me and my small work to make this memorial to all my comrades come to existence. My bigger honor will be to stand next to Colonel Alexander Jefferson. He's everything I hoped to be when I enlisted in service. He's my hero. He's my, what I hope to accomplish. Again, Alex, I salute you. You are representative of World War II of our heroes, and I salute you again. And every man that's here has done what he had to do to help this country be what it is. Don't give up, fellas. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, now I'm gonna bring up our Vice President, Russell Levine, and he's gonna do the Victory Award for Alexander Jefferson. Thank you, Debbie. Everybody hear me okay? So before I bring up our next uh, recipient for the uh, Victory Award, I'd like to play a trailer of a recent documentary made by a local filmmaker, Mike Rott. Controlled by the 
interrogate him at a big pull. This is like class ticket. And the Germans do everything about every man. Look at these care. And the Germans call American fight pilots little gangsters. Air gangsters. They would depict American fighters as gangsters. From the German point of view. To us, we were simply doing our job. Ladies and gentlemen, Alexander Jefferson. In 1942, Alex entered a military so segregated that even blood plasma was segregated, separated by race. In 1945, he returned to a world largely unchanged in attitude. One disbelieving professor in graduate school even called Alex a liar when he wrote about his experiences as a pilot. But you, as you can read as the placard when you entered the room that talked about the double V campaign, the world finally started to change. Alex went on to a distinguished career as a teacher and administrator in the Detroit Public Schools. In 1972, the first meeting of the Detroit chapter of the Tuskegee Airmen was held in his basement. With his help, it has become an international organization. These details and more can be read about in his book, Red Tail Captured, Red Tail Free. It has a lot more information about Alex's life and career. Not one to slow down after 94 years, <laughs> Alex continues to contribute. As you might have seen in the scroll that was running earlier, we have that. The memorial will feature three statue scenes representing forces on land, on sea, and in the air. Each statue scene has a home front side and a war front side, which are connected by a Michigan theme. In the air scene, which we'll see next, blown up, we see Rosie the Riveter. And that's not the Rosie the Riveter that's in the back of the room. That'll be a different Rosie the Riveter. Um, working on the skin of a B-24 bomber at the Ford Willow Run plant. On the other side of the scene is a bomber pilot getting ready to fly a mission in the plane that Rosie built. Finally, standing next to the bomber pilot is a fighter escort pilot, a Tuskegee Airman. Most of these fighter pilots trained at, in Michigan's own Selfridge Army Air Base, thus completing the Michigan story. Alex has been our consultant to ensure historical accuracy of this figure. Oops, the next slide. Working with our project sculptor, Larry Halbert and Tad McKellum. It's all well and good to consult books with posed pictures, but they are not going to reflect how these men wore their uniforms, scrambled for a mission, or held their gear. These are exactly the kind of details that will engage our visitors at the memorial and bring, and bring it to life. It has, been it has been like having a time machine to work with, and we can't thank Alex enough for that. Beyond this, Alex has appeared in our promotional videos, at our events, and provided press interviews, and in general, been our ambassador. In short, we have been privileged to work with someone in the flesh who has been such a key part of the Michigan World War II story and whose chapter in that story will be preserved in bronze at the Michigan World War II Legacy Memorial for generations. So now we are privileged to present him with a small token of our appreciation. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. All I can do, bingo. All I can do is just say thank you. I'm, I'm like a mosquito flying over a nudist colony. <laughs> I got so much to cover, I don't know where to start. <laughs> That's awesome. 
think about it. <laughs> An auspicious occasion like this, words, somebody said, best goddamn country in the world. Do you understand where I'm coming from? Why, why did Truman, in 1948, take up his pen and integrate the armed forces on the experience of the Tuskegee Airmen, the 761st Tank Battalion, the Triple Nickel, and all the other blacks, men and women, who contributed to the war, Second World War. You see, basically we feel that this is our goddamn country. Excuse my purple English, but it can I get across to you. They've often said, why fight for a country with segregation and discrimination? But to prove to you that this is our country and we'll fight for the right, for the character who sat down on his, what, he bent his knee? Hell, I'll never stand next to him. But to let you know that this memorial, World War II memorial, is for all the people who worked and fought in World War II. Bingo. Thanks, Luke. Thank hey, what's that pin you're wearing? Oh, this. I wear it to remember my dad. He was in the army. I wear this pin for my husband, who was killed in action. My son served his country proudly. Not a day goes by that I don't think about him. She was my wife and best friend. Remember, respect, and honor our fallen military heroes and the sacrifice and strength of surviving families who wear the gold star pins. My name is Caitlin. I'm six years old. I like to go to the beach with my cousins. When I was a baby, I was very sick. And then I got a liver transplant from my organ donor. He saved my life. This gift of life was made possible by an organ donor. Imagine what you could make possible. Sign up as an organ, eye, and tissue donor. Go to organdonor.gov. You might feel like there's too many problems in the world or that you know you as a 15-year-old, 16-year-old can't really make a difference. It's not always about you. It's not just one person. It's, it's a group. It's a team. Just that simple act is transforming someone else's life. It's one of the best feelings in the world. It'll just make you feel so good about yourself. I'd do anything to convince you just to be a part of this. lesson this evening from a gentleman who has written a lovely book about the arsenal of democracy and Detroit's contributions. He is Professor Gregory Sumner. He is the history professor at the University of Detroit Mercy. He has authored Detroit in World War II, and we're excited to have him with us tonight. He is our history channel for this evening. Please welcome Professor Gregory Sumner. Thank you, Guy. That's a tough act to follow, I have to say. I saw some people, they heard the words history professor and they started to hit the exits, so don't do that. I am so delighted to be here and I have to say, you are my people. I don't have to convince you about what we're doing. Um, my day job is to stand in front of 20 year olds and try to get them excited about history and it ain't easy. And it actually seems to be getting harder and harder. I don't know if this is the schools, the parents, I think these devices that all of our 20 year olds are using all the time. Uh, history, there's a lot of young people who don't know hardly any history, including World War II. So that's why this project is so desperately important. I mean, I have students today who they can't tell you, they don't know the date, December 7th, 1941. And they can't, I've had students say, they're not sure who we were fighting in the Second World War. 
So I'm not kidding, we have a problem. I think it's always been a problem that we don't value history like we should. But this room in here are quite inspiring to me and you all ought to be telling the history of Detroit rather than me speaking to you. Um, I'm just so honored that I was asked to be part of this. Let me give my thanks to uh, Debbie Hollis, Russell Levine, and the World War II Legacy Memorial. Will you please spread the word about this project? This is something everybody needs to be involved in. Thank you for your generosity and support and all of the volunteers and all of the members. Just my thanks. Um, I'm so honored to be speaking, humbled to be speaking before all the veterans in this room, particularly the World War II veterans. And why don't I say hello, thank you to the band. How about a hand for the band, Ron Kishkuk and the band. I think they're gonna play for us. They told me if I gave them a plug, I could sing, Is You Is or Is You Ain't My Baby. No? Okay, maybe not. Um, I was asked a couple of years ago by the History Press, maybe you've seen these books, the Arcadia books, the Wonderful Picture books, and then Arcadia, they do local histories. I'm sitting in my office in 2014, April, and I get a call and from the editor and he says, you know, sir, we have a uh, book on Baltimore and World War II. We have a book on Pittsburgh and World War II. Would you like to do, do a book on, did you, before you finish the sentence, I said, I'll take it. What an incredibly rich topic. And I knew, you know, I had to do this thing. Detroit, everybody knows the arsenal of democracy. They were giving me an opportunity to do some research and to write a book that I think ordinary folks can read, uh, people who live through the times can read, and my 20-year-old college students can read and maybe get excited about Detroit. Not just the story of production, and everybody knows this phrase, arsenal of democracy. It really was the capital of the arsenal of democracy. And I've heard so many stories tonight about Rosie the Riveters and people working in the war plants, as well as airmen, uh, sailors, infantry, wonderful stories. Um, they asked me to write this book and they did a very dangerous thing. They said, go ahead and write whatever you want. Just give us 40,000 words and 50 pictures. And I did it. So. Um, I have to make a confession though, and I just want to say a few things about the process of writing a book about Detroit in World War II, and then I believe we have a slideshow of some of the images uh, from the book. I have to first make a confession. Will you raise your hands? How many of you are Detroiters, grew up in Detroit, lived in Detroit? A lot of people in this room. How many of you are East Siders? I discovered there's a difference. How many of you are West Siders? Ah, 50-50, not too bad. Here's my confession. I wrote a book about Detroit in World War II, and I am not from Detroit. I never rode a Bob Lowe boat or danced on the Moonlight Cruise. I never got to see the Christmas display at the Hudson's Building downtown. I'm here, I don't, I'm not asking for your pity. I'm just telling you who I am. Um, in fact, I moved here in, two, in 1993, and. A couple of years after I moved here, they blew the building up, the Hudson's building. I'm thinking, what kind of a city is this that blows up its buildings? I didn't really think about better made potato chips or Sanders hot fudge. Yeah, I never thought of these things. I never went to the Ford Rotunda before it burned down. I never rode the streetcars. Did you know, many of you know, that Detroit had a streetcar system in world, during World War II of over 500 miles? How many of you, uh, raise your hand if you've ridden Detroit streetcars. I think the last one came off the line, uh, came off and I think they sold the cars to Mexico City back in 1956, the year I was born. So I didn't get to do any of these things. I'm from Indianapolis, I'm from the Midwest. I understand this place, I came here uh, to work at the University of Detroit Mercy. I'm from Indianapolis, but I'm not a Detroiter. In fact, my Hoosier mind, I just have to say this, my Hoosier mind still can't get wrapped around the idea that you all drive south to go to Canada. I just can't, I've never yet figured that one out. So I'm talking to people who, some of you live through these times, or your parents or your grandparents, you ought to be talking to me about it. But I basically, when I wrote the book, I became sort of a sponge for stories and I wanted to talk about more than just kind of this cliche of the arsenal of democracy. I wanted to talk about what was everyday life, life like in Detroit? Movie theaters, there are over 100 movie theaters in the city of Detroit. 
uh, back in the 1940s. If I had a smaller group, I'd be asking you, what was your neighborhood theater? There's only one left now, it's the Redford Theater, as far as the neighborhood theater, and the, the big one's downtown. I wanted to talk about sports. Joe Lewis, the Red Wings. The Lions went 0-11 in 1942. I wanted to talk about the Tigers. I wanted to talk about scrap drives, ration coupon books. My students are quite amazed about rationing. They don't quite understand that you couldn't get tires during World War II, that uh, with an A coupon, you could get three gallons of gas. Of course, there was a booming black market. And, um, you know, how many of you remember rationing and ration coupon books? Uh, quite a time, right? Victory Gardens. And in fact, Walter Winchell, I quote in the book a poem written by Walter Winchell, the, you know, the, the syndicated columnist in, back in the, when newspapers were popular during the 40s. He wrote, Walter Winchell wrote a short little poem about rationing. And can I just recite it to you if I can remember? It goes like this. Roses are red, sugar, roses are red, violets are blue, sugar is sweet, remember? rationing. My students, you know, it's quite a shock to them. They don't know what jukeboxes are. You know, they don't know uh, what records are, for gosh sakes. So um, I really wanted to do a kind of one-stop shopping. What was it like? I think it was, even though death was ever present, we must never forget the sacrifice and the way people were affected and the Blue Star families and the Gold Star families. I also think it was almost kind of fun for a lot of kids to grow up in Detroit back in those days. I'm told there was a time when people didn't lock their doors in the city of Detroit, uh, when a kid could ride their bike with their friends kind of all over the city and nobody really worried too much about it. If you did something wrong, it was gonna get back to your mother or to your father. There was more maybe a sense of neighborliness back in those days. And I'm told that kids back in, during World War II could stay out quote, until the lights came on in the, sem in the summer at 10 o'clock. So there was a lot of freedom, you know. And I, th I do think kids were following the war. They were doing scrap drives, pulling their little wagons on a Saturday morning. They were helping to buy victory uh, war bonds, maybe get a ticket to a Tigers game. Um, they were listening to President Roosevelt as he talked about the war on the radio. And they had little maps in the newspaper, color maps sometimes, and they would put little stick pins for Guadalcanal and all of these remote places. I have to say also, students today don't know much just uh, geography. They, I don't know which is worse, their historical knowledge, generally speaking, or their, their geography knowledge. I have to do say this, though. There are always some young people who love history, who get it, who are interested in these things. They tend to be students who have had a really inspiring high school teacher, or they had parents who took them to Civil War battlefields, who took them to Washington, D.C. to see the Iwo Jima Monument and that kind of thing. So history, interest in history can, can, be, can be encouraged. And uh, in my small way, I, I'm trying to keep the flame alive. Memories, and I think the young people in metropolitan Detroit should be proud, should know about what their parents, grandparents, great-grandparents were doing uh, to win the war. And I also tell my students, this is right, correct? We could have lost that war. We, by the time the United States got into the war, December 7th, 1941, the bad guys seemed to be winning. And it was not at all sure that we were going to win the war. And Detroit converted almost overnight. Uh, there had been some buildup, but the auto industry, every tool and die shop, every small industrial enterprise in the city of Detroit. And I, when I talk about Detroit, I mean metropolitan. I include Willow Run out by Ypsilanti. I include Ann Arbor. I include Royal Oak and so forth. There were many people, you know, who thought the United States could not do the war production needed to win the war. And, and um, I'll quote Hermann Goering, Hitler's Reich Marshal, who was asked in 1940, uh, are you concerned about the United States coming into the war against Germany? And in his typically arrogant way, he scoffed and said, Americans only know how to make refrigerators and razor blades. So Goering was very skeptical. It was not at all clear that we would be able to pull together and that we would do the production needed to win the war. Let me just say a few words before I get to the slides. Um, 
some surprises I encountered as I did my research and then wrote this book. Uh, the first thing I would say is I was surprised at the, the size and the scale of the production coming out of the country as a whole, but particularly Detroit. No city produced more to defeat the Nazis, to defeat Japan and the Axis than the, than the city of Detroit. And as I say, a lot of people weren't sure that we could do it. And it's just amazing. I, get, I knew about the arsenal of democracy. I knew about our massive war production. I knew about Rosie the Riveter and the war plants operating 24 hours a day. I just didn't know how large the production was. For instance, um, Chrysler Corporation got a contract to build tanks. And they built a massive tank plant, a tank arsenal, way out in the sticks, 12 mile in mound. Warren Township, they still had woods and cornfields. A massive, gigantic building designed by the great architect Albert Kahn, who designed so much, so many of the great buildings, um, and particularly industrial buildings. I love Albert Kahn because he's the son of a German rabbi who probably did as much to defeat Hitler as anybody I can think of. So Chrysler built this massive tank arsenal, and they started production, and things went pretty smoothly. And by the last year of the war, that one plant was producing more tanks than the Third Reich was producing in a year. And they were good tanks. It started with the M3 tank and then the M M4 Sherman tank. And uh, at the end of the war, I mean, the, the numbers are staggering. Tanks are hard things to build. Out of that one single plant, the Warren Tank Ar Arsenal of Chrysler, we produced over 22,000 tanks. That's a lot, and um, they, our allies needed these things. And we produced jeeps and trucks and bullets and steel combat helmets and all the implements of war, billions of rounds of small arms ammunition. The production was amazing, and of course the tank arsenal is one example, over 22,000 tanks. Did you know that Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union was our ally during World War II? Uncle Joe. I guess the enemy of my enemy is my friend. And so, you know, for four years, three and a half years, we worked with the Soviet Union and, of course, with the British. And uh, I have to say, Joseph Stalin uh, made a comment that I find very telling when he had these summit meetings with Churchill and Roosevelt. He had a couple, three summit meetings with the, the big three leaders. At the end of the first summit between Churchill, Stalin, and Roosevelt, uh, Marshal Stalin stood at the, end, at the banquet at the end of the last night's dinner and raised his glass. Short little guy, Stalin, about 5'2". I presume the glass was vodka. And he made it, he says, I would like to propose a toast to Detroit, the city that is winning this war. And, you know, the British couldn't have done it. Certainly the Soviet Union, man, did they need our, ta our trucks and all the other implements of war. The tank arsenal is a great example. Every industrial enterprise converted to war production. And uh, these massive buildings, the other big giant auto plants at the time, the Packard plant on the east side, uh, the River Rouge, of course, Highland Park. Um, the other massively giant, impressive, custom-built structure during World War II was, of course, this plant built on a, an apple orchard near a creek called Willow Run out uh, on the border between Washtenaw and Wayne County. And uh, I've talked, I spoke to the people at the Yankee Air Museum. Willow Run became a brand name around the world for massive production. Um, it didn't happen overnight. Um, in fact, this was a bit of a problem. Um, they built this plant and it had certain issues. People, have you ever noticed a picture of the Willow Run plant, massive, twin mile long assembly lines to build the B-24 Liberator bomber, which is a very difficult thing to build. Over 300,000 rivets in each plane, and they all had to be right. Over 42,000 workers at Willow Run at its peak, one third of them women. Um, and so, you know, these planes are hard to build. Ford got the contract for them, for the, for the government the contract to build the Liberator, and he basically handed it over to his son, Edsel, and to Charles Sorensen, the, the chief engineer who designed the Model T production process. And they had a job on their hands. One thing about the building, if you've ever noticed uh, an aerial shot at the Willow Run plant, it was L-shaped. 
which doesn't make any sense engineering-wise. In fact, it makes it a little more difficult, a lot more difficult. People ask me, why was the Willow Run plant L-shaped? I'm told there was a surveyor's error when they were designing this structure. Again, designed by Albert Kahn. It was his last uh, project before he died. Um, somebody made a mistake. In part, most of it was going to be built in Washtenaw County, but a little bit of the plant was going to creep into Wayne County. Sodom and Gomorrah, you know what I mean? Democrats, machine politics, strong unions, high taxes. Henry said, we're not gonna go into Wayne County. So they had to make it an L shape, it's very strange. And nobody really knew if Willow Run would be able to produce bombers. Um, it took us, it, it, the aircraft people were laughing at Detroit and laughing particularly at Henry Ford, saying you can't build bombers, they're different than automobiles. Um, and um, they were very skeptical, Lockheed and Boeing and those people on the, the West Coast. Um, it, Henry Ford went to the press and said, okay, they make about one or two planes a day in their uh, plants out in San Diego. We're gonna make one plane per hour. He said this to the press even before the building was finished. And I'm sure Edsel was going, oh my God, Dad, what have you done? Um, and Edsel Ford is actually a real hero in this book, and I feel badly he's known for that car or whatever. He really made Willow Run happen. It didn't happen overnight. Uh, it was a very complicated process. There were lots of adjustments. The planes were changed. The B-24 Liberator is very complex. After one year, there had been, they produced one plane. And those folks out on the West Coast started to call Willow Run, Will It Run? And you can imagine how that went down with Henry. Um, but they persevered, they got the kinks out of the system, and uh, sure enough, I would say by 1944, Willow Run was putting out a new Liberator bomber, one per every 58 minutes, one per every 63 minutes, close enough, about one per hour. And again, we were producing more planes in that one plant than their, their enemies were producing in a year at that time. We just outproduced them, and Detroit led the way on that. So at the end of the day, Willow Run, are you kidding me? 8,686 B-24 bombers in a little over three years? You must be kidding me. The scale of the production, and I got my Rosies back here. I gotta say something to Rosie. I got to go to the Rosie event last year where we, we, I say, the women set a record, a Guinness Book of World Records, which taking it away from those bad people on the West Coast. Oh, I love your uniform. If you look back here, uh, they put a call out at Yankee Air Museum to try to beat a record set by an aircraft group out in, a uh, historic group out in Southern California of gathering females dressed like Rosie. And they put a call out, and I think they got about 1,100 or something along those lines. And so, of course, Rosie the Riveter really should be in Michigan, really should be a Detroit thing. I'm talking to you now. I went to this event. They put out the call. It was, uh, I think, the third Saturday of last October, a little over a year ago. And oh my gosh, they put out the call. Women had to wear a uh, blue work suit. Well, just look at these. Maybe a lunch pail, uh, work boots, red socks, and of course, the red bandana. And I have to say, first of all, it's a big building, the remaining building at Willow Run. I have never seen so many strong women in one building. It was a little bit intimidating for us. Man, I took pictures. I saw little uh, two and three and four girl, year old girls with their little Rosie the Riveter bandanas. I saw, um, I saw a, a very tough looking 20 something gal with big muscles who had the We Can Do It emblem on her. On her, for, on her bicep, and I said, can I come up and take a picture? And she let me take her picture. My students do know this one. They knew we can do it. Everybody knows that icon. They're doing it back there. You're really, I love it. So uh, the women got together, and of course, the real Rosies were there. These gals in their late 80s, early 90s, they're riding around in golf carts. They did riveting. Wendy the welder, I mean, they were there. They were the guests of honor and they were riding around in their golf carts. And I have to say about these ladies, they could probably do it now if we, they needed to go work in a war plant. They're tough, they're ready to go. And I think w the, the record was shattered. I think we had 2,100 somewhere along that line. We absolutely shattered the record. So Rosie, let's have a hand for our Rosie group back here and Rosie the Riveter in general. 
I could go on about production. I want to use two phrases from the 40s that really summarize my view of Detroit and the American home front and our soldiers, sailors, airmen. Two phrases that really capture it for me. One comes from the military, and the phrase is can do. Can do. You need us to build 8,600 8, 8, B-24s? Can do. This attitude that whatever needs to be done, we will do it. And after Pearl Harbor, we were highly motivated. You need us to build 22,000 tanks? Can do. It's very inspiring to me. I really do think it was the greatest generation that pulled together to do these things. So can do is a great phrase. The other word I like to use, and I would like you to raise your hand if you know this word when I say it. People don't use it anymore. These gals back here have it, this quality I'm going to talk about, it's one word. Rosie had it, the war plant workers had it, our soldiers had it, Americans had it. Raise your hand if you know this word. The word is, Detroiters had moxie. Raise your hand if you know it. moxie which I have been told is named after a soft drink uh, that um, had vitamins in it and was supposed to make you strong. But what is moxie? It's determination, it's grit. You get knocked down, you won't be, you dust yourself off and get back up. That really, that word moxie, I'd like you to start using the word moxie. Use it 20 times in the next month and I want to hear it and we'll get it back in circulation. We need moxie and nobody had it more than Rosie. So I'm delighted that those folks are here. So connected to the massive scale of production, I was surprised by another thing as I studied Detroit during the war. You're gonna be shocked by this, something called teamwork. Americans pulling together, putting aside their differences in a common effort. We were very divided before Pearl Harbor, after Pearl Harbor, great, great unity of purpose. That doesn't mean everybody was an angel during World War II. There were criminals, black marketeers, there were draft dodgers, they're human beings. But I see a level of cooperation, of teamwork, even, get this, bipartisanship. Um, Democrats and Republicans working together in the common interest. When France fell, the first phone call, France fell in 1940 and really we became very nervous uh, because only England was out there. President Roosevelt made a very important phone call. The first phone call he made when Hitler had conquered most of Western Europe, he called Detroit. He called William Knudsen, Big Bill Knudsen, President and CEO of General Motors. And if you'll indulge me, I can almost imagine the phone call. Um, Mr. Knudsen, we need a crash munitions program. Will you lead it? What's interesting is uh, William Knudsen was a hardcore Republican. He didn't like the Roosevelts very much. He didn't like the New Deal. Was, you know, he wasn't really uh, on the same page politically. His response was, yes. Mr. President, where do you need me? And within a week, he was in Washington, D.C. as the most important, I would say, of the dollar a year men donating their services to organize what is the greatest crash program of munitions work and industrial production in history. So um, as President Roosevelt would say, he would say, um, can you even imagine it? Government, big business, and labor working together. Isn't that a concept? So as people read this book, I hope they're inspired by the moxie, by the can-do, by the scale of the production, what an achievement it was, Detroit leading the way, and by bipartisanship and teamwork. These are wonderful things. Um, I could talk about other things that surprised me. There was segregation, of course. Uh, the group of Tuskegee Airmen stationed at Selfridge had to be very careful where they went off base. We fought with a segregated army. I think Guy mentioned he, they even segregated the blood according to the um, race of the donor. It was a very uh, difficult situation. And of course, Detroit was the ultimate boom town. Thousands, thousands moved up from the south, white and black, crammed in looking for housing, looking for jobs. And the thing exploded in June of 1943, if, if you know what I'm talking about. A race riot, the worst in the country during the war. There were other race riots in crowded boom towns where whites and blacks, especially from the south, are kind of crammed together. Detroit had the worst one, started on the Belle Isle Bridge. National Guard had to be called out, 5,000 troops in the middle of a war. And at the end of the day, officially 34 dead, hundreds more wounded and injured. So, you know, I moved to Detroit 20 plus years ago. People say to me as a history professor, well, what do you think of the Detroit race riot? 
and I say, which one? Because you're usually talking about 1967, but right in the middle of World War II, Detroit had a, a terrific, horrible race riot. The good news is I think World War II and the efforts of the Tuskegee men and the 761st Tank Battalion and others and the war workers, we must start to move toward dismantling Jim Crow segregation. And then I want to get to the slides, but let me say about daily life. The other surprise to me is the 24-hourness of Detroit. You know what I mean? The joint was jumping 24 hours a day, every day of the week, seven days a week. You could go to the movies at midnight. Detroit had a newsreel theater. If you get off your second or third shift, you could go to the movies. How much did a movie cost? Does anybody remember what a movie ticket cost back in, uh, during World War II? 10 cents? Yeah. Okay. How much was a streetcar ride? A nickel. And I think you get transfers, you got the world at your feet. What a concept. Everybody had movie theaters and going to the, I think kids spent the whole Saturday morning and afternoon watching newsreels, watching, uh, you know, of course radio was a part of it. My students don't understand a period where radio was the dominant medium. Um, I studied Detroit carefully, I talked to people, the ballrooms. Detroit had these wonderful dance ballrooms where you would hear music like this. Um, the Vanity Ballroom on East Jefferson, still standing. I, had, I took a picture of it. They wanted some current pictures. It's sort of crumbling, but it's there, and it's beautiful. Uh, the Grandy Ballroom for my West Siders, the Crystal Ballroom on Woodward, the Paradise Theater, the Greystone. These were massively uh, attended places, and they had what were called floating dance floors. Anybody know what I mean by a floating dance floor? They built these beautiful maple floors on springs so that when you are lindy hopping or jitterbugging, I guess you're getting some extra balance. Is that the idea? So, uh, and, and I talked to a wonderful woman, Barbara Williams. She's, she was a teenager during World War II. She said, we went dancing every weekend. It was good, clean, fun. They served burners, no alcohol at the vanity. And uh, we just had a great time. I would never marry a man who couldn't dance. Uh, and so the wonderful music of World War II. Um, I discovered, for instance, there were Italian prisoners of war stationed, uh, kept at Fort Wayne. And these were the happiest guys you ever saw. They were out of the war. And uh, many of them married American women or uh, came back and became American citizens. Detroit had a victory beer. Beer was watered down. This really bothers my students when we talk about rationing, 3-2 beer. But you can still get it. And um, the Coppets Brewery down on Atwater had something called Victory Beer. And the label had a tank or a jeep or a piece of ordnance or a submarine. So drinking beer could be a patriotic gesture, which I think is kind of nice. And I talk about sports. I don't know if you're a sports fan. I am. Um, the games continue, as you know. And baseball continued, the Red Wings continued to play. Um, the Tigers played, and I have to say, the best players were gone, mostly. If you ever saw a league of their own or something like that, you know DiMaggio was gone in the service for the Yankees. Ted Williams, two wars, uh, World War II and Korea as a Marine pilot. Imagine Ted Williams' numbers if he hadn't been gone for that time period. Patriotism. Um, and most of the good Tiger players were gone, including, above all, Hank Greenberg. If there's one hero above all in my book, it's Hank Greenberg. Um, and so I said, I have a great line in the book, I say the beer, at the, the, the play at Briggs Stadium was as watered down as the beer. And it really was. It wasn't a pretty sight to see in many cases. You had old guys, young guys, not so skilled. But the guys were gone, but Roosevelt said we need to continue the games because it's too important to civilian morale. Hank Greenberg is a great hero for a number of reasons. I knew about him. Who doesn't know about Hank Greenberg? Right? Hall of Famer. I've seen the statue out there at Comerica Park, and he really was Detroit's answer to Babe Ruth. Six foot four strapping guy, hit 58 home runs one year. He was the all-American Goliath, a massively popular player. And he also happened to be the only openly Jewish ball player in the major leagues in the late 1930s when Hitler is on the march. 
And I have a great quote from him, from Hank Greenberg in the book. He said, I'm playing for the Tigers, I'm playing around these stadiums. Hank Greenberg said, you know, I'm always in the spotlight. People are watching me, I have to perform. If I'm at another ballpark and I don't perform, there's gonna be some SOB calling me every name in the book. And so he was very aware. He wouldn't play on high holidays. He wouldn't play on Rosh Hashanah. He took a lot of hate mail for that. But he endured and had this Hall of Fame career. He said, in the late 30s, he said, when I hit a home run as a Jewish man, I feel like I'm hitting one against Hitler. And I just love that. Then Hank Greenberg, after Pearl Harbor, goes into the Army Air Corps. Four years plus in the China, India, Burma theater comes back with four battle stars. He was actually gone from the major leagues longer than any other major league ball player. He was a heroic person, and he came back and he didn't really want to talk about it too much. Um, so he's a genuine war hero. Did anybody in here get to actually see Hank Greenberg occasionally? What did you see? Did you see him hit a home run? or? Okay, wow. I, may I talk to you afterwards? Um, let's go, why don't we go to some slides? I don't know where my people are here. Okay, these are pictures from the book, hopefully. See if you can remember that we'll just kind of walk through these. This is um, a B-24. You probably recognize this Liberator bomber, fresh off the line from Willow Run, flying over a very smoggy, uh, polluted-looking uh, downtown Detroit. You can kind of see the, the buildings there. The B-24, which is the signature plane of Willow Run. Okay, next, please. Okay, here we go. This is a picture. People forget how divided the country was right up to December 6, 1941. You know, we had just fought a very bloody war 20 years earlier, and a lot of people thought we, what was the purpose of that? Uh, I think the majority of Americans were against going to war right up to Pearl Harbor. It took that event to change everything. This is a photo of uh, mothers against the war, mothers who want to maintain an embargo, stay out of the war. You know, Franklin Roosevelt, I was talking to someone, he came up with this program called Lend-Lease. Have you heard of that? where we lent, you know, the British and the Soviets our weaponry. And I found a woman, these are women protesting Roosevelt's trying to get us into war. I, there's a, she, one woman held a sign that said, we will not lend or lease our sons. So the, the isolationist feeling was very strong, and then we go next, transforms immediately, Pearl Harbor, um, and President Roosevelt the next day calling it a date which will live in infamy. This is actually a picture from the memorial at the Arizona at Pearl Harbor. Raise your hand if you've been to Pearl Harbor to the memorial. It's on my list. I won't call it a bucket list. Uh, a friend of mine took this last year, and um, it actually, in the middle of all those names, 2,403 Americans dead as a result of that attack. If you look in the middle there, Ben Marsh, Ensign Ben Marsh, who many consider to be the first official casualty of the war, uh, killed at Pearl Harbor. You know, his family in Gross Point got that telegram. I talked to many people who said, in our neighborhood, we knew when that Western Union guy came and knocked on the door, it was a regret to inform. The whole neighborhood knew about it. Ben Marsh, uh, people are, this completely mobilizes and changes the mood of the country, Pearl Harbor. How many of you remember the attack on Pearl Harbor? Oh boy, I wish I, I'll sit around, I'll drink some beers with you. You can tell me what you were, listen to the Lions game. Let's go to the next, um, this is the day, this is the week after Pearl Harbor. Look at the line at the induction center. Men and women ready to enlist. Um, the line around the Fort Street induction center went around several blocks. Everybody was suddenly in a mood to join the war effort. And so that's downtown, that's uh, actually on Woodward. It's a nice photo thanks to the Ruther Library. Here's a picture I picked. This is a group of British children in Windsor. And I actually consider Windsor, you know, Canada's motor city, part of our metropolitan area. I like this photo because these are British children who have been sent from England because England was being bombed. And uh, they're kind of orphans. They were very well treated by the people, the Canadians. Uh, they were sent all over Canada, but this group was in Windsor they were very well treated, they were treated like family, but notice they're away from home, and I kind of see that. They're exiles, they are refugees, and I think you see these kids, and it reminds you of how bad things were in the early part of the war across the Atlantic. These are British children in Windsor. Next, please. Ah, here's the master architect himself at his Fisher building 
office, Albert Kahn. Raise your hand if you knew Albert Kahn, if you know that name. He's the man. Uh, he designed so many beautiful things. He's the greatest architect this area has ever known. And uh, next, please. He designed the, the uh, Chrysler tank arsenal. Here's a photograph of the arsenal going kind of at top flow. And it is a massive scene. Um, and can you imagine how noisy that was? And um, we were talking uh, both the Chrysler tank arsenal, the Packard plant, River Rouge, Highland Park, and Willow Run all got the E for Excellence production uh, flag, um, indicating that they had produced beyond the quota and produced excellent implements for the boys at war. I talked to so many Rosies and read about them and talked to so many war workers and they said, you know, when we're doing these rivets, they all have to be right. Because these boys are out there where the lead is flying, they're in the line of fire. There's a real sense of connection to our soldiers. So that's a nice panoramic view of the Chrysler tank arsenal. And, next, um, and here's a nice, I really like this picture. Teamwork, I have captioned. It almost reminds me of the Diego Rivera mural downtown where they have men working together. It's a very beautiful picture from the Ruther Archive. Next. And uh, this is the first tank off the line in April of 1941, even before we got into the war. It's an M3 tank, and uh, it was a big production. April 24th, uh, they, showed, they showed what it could do. It's shattering into toothpicks, a telephone pole. Uh, WJR was there, the mayor, the governor, the military brass, and it was on live radio, the first tank off the line, the first of 22,000 off the line at the Chrysler Tank Arsenal. Next, please. And now we have the day, this is one of my favorites, the day the Roosevelts visited wartime Detroit. Um, President Roosevelt wanted to make a tour of war plants to see how things were going and also military bases. And so it was a big production to move FDR, you know. He, couldn't walk, they had to have security, they had to move him around uh, with all kinds of uh, extra effort. Um, his first stop was the Warren Tank Arsenal on September 18, 1942, at a time when the arsenal, and he was also gonna go to Willow Run early in the war. And Eleanor went with him. Eleanor actually traveled on this tour of war plants. The first stop was the tank arsenal, and this is the president, it was unannounced, the managers won't even, weren't even told, certainly the workers weren't told that the presidential party was coming till the day of the event. I talked to some people, they said, we're working on our tanks, and we look up there at the, at the rail platform, and my God, that's Franklin Roosevelt, the president, and he's of course doing his usual, he's standing there with the braces, but he's like in campaign mode. People start clapping, whistling, it's quite a scene. You can imagine how shocking that was. Next picture. Uh, President and Mrs. Roosevelt are being uh, told by Mr. Keller, the CEO of Chrysler, about the tank production process, and they're listening very attentively as they're riding in the limousine through the, the open car, uh, convertible through the, through the factory. And this is one a very interesting picture. After they saw some of the inside of the tank plant, they went out to the figure eight test track to see the new M4 Sherman tank prototype to see how it was going to be tested. And so, several of them were out there going in the mud and going through ditches and breaking telephone poles and do the, doing all they did. And you can see Mr. and Mrs. Roosevelt there watching with great attentiveness and he's smiling. Uh, can, can, you, can you go back, because uh, I gotta dwell on this for a second. About within a minute after this picture was taken, one of the M3, Sher one of the M4 Shermans came barreling directly at the presidential car and stopped either inches or feet short of disaster. I guess they were showing off the new braking system and uh, the Secret Service went ape. They were very, very upset with this. Uh, the dust was flying, it was a scary moment, and Roosevelt typically just laughed it off. Whatever you want to say about Franklin Roosevelt, he was a cool customer. And he said, a nice drive, a good drive, my man, and everyone started laughing. But I've often wondered, how would history have been different if President Roosevelt had been flattened at the tank plant in Warren in 1942? Uh, it, it almost came to catastrophe. So the tank arsenal in the early afternoon, and then the next stop you go to Willow Run, if we can the next one. And um, Henry Ford was another guy. He didn't like the Roosevelts. Uh, he really didn't like anything about them. And this is a picture of, they, they went out in there in their car visiting Willow Run out near Belleville in Ypsilanti. 
And um, actually, when the, when, the, when the presidential party arrived, they couldn't find Henry. Edsel had to send out a search party to find the old man. He was in the most remote, remote part of this massive building working on some little project. They practically had to drag him to come and greet the president and the first lady, and there he is. And I, my caption under this picture is, Henry forces a smile, because he's trying to be gracious. Even worse for Henry during this visit, they then made him sit between Eleanor and Franklin in the back of the limo. And he just kind of sank down. They were pretty tall people. And Edsel later said, my father just scowled at us the whole time as we rode through the plant and our workers were cheering. The Roosevelts made a big trip and they were impressed with what they saw and soon Will Run was going to produce, be producing one per hour. There's the assembly line, twin, twin assembly line at Will Run. It's just an amazing thing built out of thin air. Next, please. Um, Rosie, how about a hand for Rosie? Uh, all kinds of Rosies. This is Will Run. Yankee Air Museum gave me these pictures. Uh, this is a woman working on a plexiglass window, obviously. Next, please. And here's, I think this is sort of a glamour shot, posed, right? Uh, her hair is just right, but that's Rosie the Riveter working on a B-24 at the Willow Run plant. Next, please. <clears throat> Housing was in short supply, particularly around Willow Run out there. They didn't build enough houses. So people lived in cramped conditions. Some of them lived in tents. Some of them lived in buildings. This is a two-family duplex, actually, and you can see the conditions, uh, probably no you know, running water maybe. People lived in very uh, kind of cramped conditions. Here's what people were living with. People had to double up. People had to take in borders. This is a family kind of cramped together during the war. Um, and people just made do with it. Next, please. The streetcar, uh, the streetcars of Detroit. Uh, this is the Grand River, I think, streetcar downtown. Boy, I wish I could have ridden on one of those. Um, and guess what? Women were not only working in war plants, they were driving taxis, they were pumping gas, they were doing all kinds of jobs. Even the Detroit streetcar, city of Detroit, next please, hired the women to be conductor ets. This is Marguerite Watson, Detroit's first female uh, streetcar conductor, coming home from work. There's some ads up there, and she's pretty happy about what she's doing. She's getting a good paycheck, by the way, housewife. Next please. Um, I had to have a picture of Uncle Sam clobbering Hitler. I just had to have that on the posters you might see. United Auto Workers, uh, very, very big on the idea of patriotism and pulling together for the war effort. Next, please. These are uh, guards, National Guardsmen, the night of Pearl Harbor, December 7th. They are setting up machine guns at the Detroit Windsor Tunnel and at the bridge. This is at the tunnel. And they are putting up, you know, they suddenly barbed wire appeared and high security. The city was really afraid of being bombed. People remember civil defense drills. I'm looking at these guys, I'm not sure they really know what they're doing with this machine gun, but they're suddenly sandbags appear in front of war plants and government buildings and radio stations. Everybody was on high alert because they didn't know. It turned out they couldn't reach us in Detroit, but everybody was afraid the Germans or even the Japanese. Were